Hello there. Welcome again to our program of digital slide review. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture of the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter, seeking to provide high quality educational materials in uh, anatomic pathology uh, to interested learners throughout the world. Our case today comes from the realm of GYN pathology. It's a relatively unusual case uh, that uh, doesn't come up uh, terribly often, and I thought might be of interest to uh, our uh, listeners uh, in, this, in this regard. The patient is a 65-year-old woman who has a, uh, a complex uh, adnexal mass, and uh, she's had some symptoms of bloating and discomfort, um, and on evaluation with her primary care doc, she's found to have an elevated CA125. Well, let's first look at that uh, tumor marker. What are the things that tend to cause an elevated CA125? When this was first uh, touted in the 1980s, uh, it was uh, looked at primarily as a screening tool to identify uh, ovarian cancer at an earlier stage. But as uh, the case would be, we discovered that it also is elevated in a variety of non-ovarian cancer situations. So other cancers that affect the uh, peritoneum can certainly elevate the CA125, whether it's tested for or not, but also endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, even uh, a number of inflammatory diseases involving the bowel uh, or effusions due to cirrhosis or other sorts of things can cause this. Uh, occasionally, colon polyps even will produce a mild elevation of this uh, disorder. And patients with coronary artery disease, uh, particularly if they're developing a little bit of uh, congestive failure or uh, irritation of the pericardium or other uh, mesothelial surfaces, can have an elevated number, uh, of elevated value. So essentially, anything that may, in, uh, that may inflame or irritate a mesothelial line surface can end up elevating the serum CA125. So ovarian cancer does that, but so do a lot of other things. Um, so the patient came to surgery and uh, the ovary, ovarian mass was found to be um, uh, large, about, about 20 centimeters. And a sample was submitted for frozen section, which you see here. Now at low magnification, aside from these knife marks that you see cutting across the tissue, we see that it's a mixture of uh, cystic uh, spaces, uh, and we have some bluish tissue here uh, and apparent epithelial lining. So as this was evaluated in our laboratory, um, the uh, person doing the frozen section correctly identified that we have a mixture of epithelial cell types here. Some areas looking quite glandular, others looking more squamoid, as you see here. And then this very cellular stroma uh, was thought to possibly be neuropil or immature um, mesenchyme. Um, and so uh, a diagnosis was rendered of uh, a probable mature cystic teratoma, uh, feeling that this might represent uh, neuropil or some other immature mesenchyme. So uh, that uh, is uh, an interesting diagnosis, certainly something that would be possible in a woman of this uh, age, um, but it doesn't quite uh, capture exactly what uh, I think we should be thinking of in this case. So uh, what, what should we be considering when we see a mixture of epithelial and stromal elements? Well, certainly teratomas would fit into that category, well, usually the epithelium is uh, more defined and definitive. This seems to be crossing back and forth between uh, squamoid, transitional, and columnar. Uh, usually it's fairly clear cut, either respiratory or squamous most commonly, uh, occasionally enteric. Carcinosarcoma certainly can have a mixture of cell types. This doesn't have that morphology. Sex cord stromal tumors may have a mesenchymal element and may occasionally have an epithelial component, most commonly mucinous cystic tumors, and then other epithelial tumors with a prominent uh, stroma. Uh, so endometriosis, endometriotic tumors, 
um, Bruner's gland tumors and so forth. There are a few, additionally, a few mesenchymal tumors that may pull in um, epithelial glandular elements like uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma, adenosarcoma, and so forth. Uh, so those are the things that should be on our mind uh, as we think about this. So uh, going to the permanent sections, here's a representative permanent section. Uh, well, we've got a couple of slides to, to look at because these are relatively uncommon tumors. So one of the things that strikes me as we look here uh, is the fact that all of these uh, cystic spaces have this sort of basal type epithelium, which is uh, uh, minimally atypical. It looks actually quite transitional. Uh, and then the surface lining epithelium, as you can see here, has a nice uh, terminal bar, a nice ciliated uh, surface uh, coming off of it. So uh, we have a benign ciliated type of epithelium, but we have this proliferative uh, reserve cell or transitional cell beneath that uh, that is uh, lighting up here. And then the stroma surrounding it is uh, fairly cellular, but not particularly atypical. Some of our areas are more solid, as you see here, with a little bit more uh, transitional type of appearance. And a few have, uh, again, this sort of microcystic pattern. So uh, all of these uh, epithelial groupings are pretty similar. Um, here's one where we don't have much of a, a, a ciliated surface. We lose it out here, and then it just becomes more transitional or squamoid here in this area. So um, I'm thinking as I look at this and uh, looked at it at low magnification, that this looks to me to fit quite well with a, uh, a Brenner tumor or a borderline Brenner tumor. Now, usually Brenner tumors are just an incidental finding uh, associated with something else like the, a case of mucinous borderline tumor that we saw earlier uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and so this to be what's causing the lesion certainly raises the consideration that this is a, a little further out on the spectrum. There's more proliferation here in this epithelial uh, component. Um, and uh, we see that there's uh, this columnar cell element here as well. So uh, borderline Brenner tumors have been described along with malignant Brenner tumors. Uh, this does not have uh, the degree of anaplasia or atypia that we would associate with a um, malignant Brenner tumor, um, but it does, uh, I think, have enough proliferation to fall into the category of a borderline uh, Brenner tumor. So let's look at another slide here and just sort of uh, confirm this pattern. As you can see, it's quite consistent throughout the multiple sections that we took. Um, some areas, the cysts are almost exclusively uh, columnar, uh, but maybe due to compression. Um, and uh, you know, we see a little bit of complexity to the uh, process here. Uh, this is certainly a sort of uh, odd architecture. Uh, and you can see here maybe a few squames uh, exfoliating into the lumen in some of these cases as well. So uh, what is a borderline Brenner tumor and how would we define it? Well, um, it is really a relatively uncommon uh, ovarian tumor. Uh, there's probably a hundred or so cases in the literature. Usually these are older adults um, and it usually has some degree of complexity with cystic and solid areas. Uh, the epithelium that's present can be uh, pure transitional can have admixed squamous or columnar cells, as we saw in our case with a lot of cilia. The differential would include, of course, teratoma, endometrioid carcinoma because of that cellular stroma, um, and a serous pseudoendometrioid or transitional carcinoma, the so-called set tumors. Metastatic lesions, possibly, but uh, I think given the benignity of the epithelium here, uh, we would uh, be fairly comfortable with that. Now, immunohistochemistry has been performed on a number of the reported cases, and most of them have been positive with CK7 and EM, EMA. Thrombomodulin, usually a transitional epithelial marker, is also positive. EGFR, P63, strongly positive. Many have been GATA3 positive, and in contrast to the benign Brenner tumors, the um, 
borderline tumors are uniformly P16 negative. Uh, it's thought that these tumors lose CDKN2A and therefore probably have a KRAS or PIK3CA mutation that is driving uh, the uh, proliferation. So we did do some immunohistochemistry chemistry on our case. Here's a nice uh, image of the CK7, as you can see, lighting up all of the epithelium, the basal uh, transitional areas, as well as the uh, um, ciliated epithelium. Uh, here is the uh, P63. Uh, and you can see that uh, again, uh, here it seems to concentrate and accentuate uh, and differentiate between the uh, surface columnar ciliated epithelium and the underlying uh, uh, epithelium, which is uh, expressing the nuclear marker quite strongly. Uh, we also did a P16 uh, on our case, and you can see here uh, that that is uh, entirely negative, not even. I mean, we see some stromal positivity in a few areas, but barely any cells in here that express P16. Now, we also did GATA3 in our particular case, and it was negative. So uh, you can't always uh, get everything perfect, um, but uh, given the preponderance of evidence, we felt like the diagnosis was uh, a uh, Brenner, borderline Brenner tumor. This raises a question in this case, and that is, what do you do if you tell them something during surgery and then the permanent sections show something a little different? Well, I think the first step is to categorize what, if any, clinical difference resulted from your frozen section diagnosis. Um, and we use a, essentially a three-tier categorization, a major uh, situation where potential harm was done or a major change in therapy would have uh, resulted from the different diagnosis, a minor uh, difference, or something that's probably insignificant and makes really no difference in, in terms of management or outcome. Um, and in making this evaluation, I think you have to ask the question, was more extensive surgery done or was needed surgery not done uh, as a consequence of what was uh, 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 informed at the time of surgery? And if that's the case, then there should be urgent person-to-person uh, -person, uh, communication of this information. If that's not the case, then it's acceptable to acknowledge the discrepancy in the report and perhaps add a word of explanation if that's uh, appropriate or needful to make, the, uh, um, to make them realize that you haven't just brushed this under the carpet and not, are not uh, going to uh, pay attention to this difference. But the most important thing from this sort of a situation is to learn from it and not just you, but your colleagues. And so in our department, we regularly include these discrepant cases in our quality review plan. And we trend this data to see what percentage of cases have a uh, change of diagnosis from initial frozen section to final sign out. Uh, then those are reviewed in a conference setting or in some other setting so that uh, we can all learn from this experience. Otherwise we would continue to make the mistakes and we don't wanna do that. And then we hold ourselves accountable by reporting that data uh, to our quality program within our hospital and other service. So this is an opportunity to apply some of the principles of quality management to the anatomic pathology laboratory. Well, with that, our final sign-out diagnosis, again, was a borderline Brenner tumor of the ovary. And uh, again, these are uncommon lesions, but uh, certainly known to exist and something that you should be familiar with if you're going to do ovarian frozen sections. We hope you enjoyed this program, and if you did, that you'll uh, hit the like button. Uh, certainly, if you have colleagues that you think would benefit from this program, don't hesitate to share it. And we do plan to continue to produce videos. So if you want to get notice, hit subscribe. And uh, you can even hit notify. That will help to make sure that you uh, get word as soon as one is released. So uh, until next time, thanks so much for joining me. I'll look forward to seeing you again.